Hi again, everybody. This is Life's Learning Curve, and I'm your host, Paul Hart. Hey, tell me a story. We're glad you're here with us today. Life's Learning Curve is a podcast all about using storytelling as a means to uh, find a better you, a better us. You know, those stories, when you think about them after they've happened a few years later, you say to yourself, oh yeah, well that's how I got there, that's what made me head down that path or that road in life, right? Oh yeah. Life's pretty unpredictable, really. You might as well sit back and enjoy it. Hey, I'm glad you're here with us today because we've got quite a treat for you. Get this, it was 1979. I'm doing an internship in Costa Rica and Central America and without knowing it, I stumbled into quite an adventure. I hadn't planned on it, it just happened. Those are the best. One type of adventure that presented me a once in a lifetime experience that I've never let go or forgotten. So let's get going. Sebastian. Here we go. This is Life's Learning Curve. I'm Paul Hart. Episode, A Town With No Name. Stand by. Stand by. Have you ever experienced a dream, but in real life, and you became aware of that fact while you're in the midst of it? What? Uh-huh. <laughs> Let me explain. Okay, okay. First of all, I have to lay down some foundation here. It's 1979. I'm in my senior year of college, and I chose to participate in a six-month internship outside of the United States in a small country called Costa Rica, which is about the size of West Virginia, quite honestly. Uh, it's just above Panama. Now, Costa Rica is in Central America. The entire country had, at that time, fair elections. People love their democracy. Besides being recommended to us at college as kind of a throwback to America in the 1940s, eh, kind of romanticized that. And it turned out that the country was just beautiful it was near the equator it was lush with flowers and happy and helpful people for the most part that's my recollection it was heavily situated in the tropics in the tourists the tourists had not found it yet they had not found costa rica so if you went to costa rica you got the real costa rica not a tourist version of it it was a, this friendly country, at least it was to me, that was my impression of things, where your dollar, your American dollar, would go farther than you might have dreamed. We were told, and it was true, you could get a steak at a restaurant, vegetables, baked potato, beer, dessert, $2.50. True. <laughs> So about 10 of us from the university back here in the mid-Midwest, we took that internship challenge to go to Costa Rica. And when we got there, we landed and we, we were paired up. We stayed with local families, volunteer families, in groupings of two. You know, so there were five families. The five families. <laughs> so there was only one other guy on the trip, Reed. And he and I paired up and we stayed with our host family. Hello. Mario and Anna and their two young children. And they lived in a well-to-do home in the city of Tibas, just north of the capital city of San Jose. <laughs> My roommate Reed and I not only had great adventures during work, but we traveled the small country exclusively with our Costa Rican families. They were our adopted families, of course. Mario and his wife Anna, as I said, and fortunately, Reed and I hit it off pretty well, too. We got on as friends right away and laughed a lot as we made our way through this very tiny yet culturally diverse country of Costa Rica. After a few weeks, we even found a couple of bright, nice, upbeat, happy girlfriends, too. Ironically, they both were named Patty. They came with us everywhere. They were our companions uh, and good friends bright and educated Costa Rican. These girls also attended the local college in Costa Rica and spoke English and they helped us translate Costa Rican into understandable English for us. We thought we spoke enough Spanish to get by. New no, Costa Rican is a whole different deal. One Costa Rican story. We were gringos, you know, we were foreigners from out of the country. 
Costa Rica held many stories for us, and, and I, I hope to share some more of them here on the podcast someday. But as for today, more specifically, I just want to tell you about a time frame in the Costa Rica six-month adventure called Semana Santa. It was kind of like Easter break for us here in the USA. So we were off of uh, work for that week, and eight of us in total. Vacation. Like I said, the year was 1979. We left Tibas for our one week of break. Fun, fun, we fun. drove two small cars. We were told of this magical place only Mario knew of. Incidentally, Mario, Holiday. Anna, his two kids, Patty Patty, Reed and I, making a total of eight of us. That's how we got to eight. Anyway, Mario knew of a place, but it had never been there. Fun, fun, fun. And he told us, it is out on the peninsula, tropical and beach. Uh, no electric power there. No juice. <laughs> now Mario was a high-placed executive in a mechanical plant in Costa Rica. He was a high muckety muck there. Since he had to travel on occasion to the States, he knew some English. He, he knew English pretty well. Not comfortable with it, but he knew it pretty well. But he really wanted to move things up to the next level in business. So he had been taking an American slang slash humor, American humor slash casual conversation class. I would have loved to attend that thing just to see what other people thought Americans thought was slang, humor, and casual conversation. So often Mario might, uh, he might missay something like... Uh, Paul, read. Uh, after dinner, we'll blow up this place. Then, I'll blow up that place. And then he would be pointing to the bathroom. Let's face it, Reed and I were silly, immature, 21-year-old guys, and we laughed at Mario's attempts at humor like seven-year-olds. <laughs> <laughs> So back to driving to the peninsula with Mario's family and four plus our girlfriends in this. Around 1 p.m. on our drive to this beach, we pulled into a tiny, dusty, tree-covered town for a cerveza, which is a beer, and tapas, which are hors d'oeuvres. It was a town named Nicoya, and if you look on a map of Costa Rica in the upper a northwestern corner, there's a peninsula, and there's a town named Nicoya. And all I can say about Nicoya is that the heat. We were so close to the equator. When you got out of the car, the heat enveloped your body. It was this heavy oppression, uber heat, and massive humidity, which practically sucker punched you when you got out of the car. We were hot and sweaty, and yet the town was somehow very dry and dusty. Up a few steps and entered this bar through the swinging doors, you know, like the ones they used to have in westerns in the films. We just push open the doors. We could see we had just entered the only bar in town. It was drab, it was dark, it was dusty, it was dirty, and dry. Yeah, alliterations, yeah, nice. Dark and dirty wood. Not a lot of painting going on back then. It was just plain wood that had gotten dark and old. I had the sense that this place had not been swept out for probably a month or so. But let's face it, the place had character. It did. Eating hot tapas that day did not sit well with me in that heat. Neither did a beer. Warm beer. Water felt like a better fit than warm beer that day. And Mario looked at me and he, he said, Paul, you want sticky hot beer? Huh? Oh, no thanks, Mario. That is what my friends call me at work. They call you sticky hot beer? That's terrible. <laughs> then, per usual, we all just laughed. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Mario. <laughs> Reed and I cracked up like any seven-year-old boys might. <laughs> After I downed a couple of ice waters and tapas, the hors d'oeuvres, Patty and I, my Patty, 
exited the bar immediately and we both eyed this young teen on a very vacant street corner. Matter of fact, the whole town was empty. It was like a town was there and everybody was just inside. Where is everybody? Or out of the sun is what I should say. And he was selling shaved ice to nobody. Well, probably it would have been to us. So it was so hot there, no one was outside. Like I said, for all appearances, it, this was like a ghost town. It looked like it had been lived in once, but not now. So the teen had a huge block of ice and he used a razor-like tool to scrape the top of the ice. And these chips fell into a cup, good-sized cup. And then he covered it in cherry syrup, you know, like a snow cone. But then he asked, Senor, con leche? With milk? And Patty said to me, oh, that's good. You've got to try the milk. It was icy cold, cherry flavored, a refreshment with this carnation instant milk that he had just opened fresh from a can and he had poured it on the top. It was excellent. Why didn't we have this in the States? Yet, I think we do now. As we sat there cooling off, I saw a local boy walk by, casually just kicking a soccer ball. And he was kick. I remember he was kicking it. It went like 20, 30 feet up in the air. Then he came down and kicked it again, straight up 20, 30. And he kept all this while he was walking forward. And he never once looked at the ball. So here is this boy out in the middle of the sparse countryside in the country of Costa Rica. Nobody will probably ever know him or discover him. But you could tell he was a potential superstar, unique, one of a kind type of kid. Interesting. We continued our two-vehicle trek four more hours. Hot. Now, one of our cars had air conditioning. That was the one we were in. <laughs> we were the only vehicles on the road, the skinny two-laner. Solamente. So two cars, eight people, and the sun. We all were traveling together, including the sun. First, we were driving down this paved two-lane and narrow, bumpy road. Then that two-lane road morphed. It changed into this two-lane uh, bumpy tire tracks without the road, just two tire tracks. Tire track. We drove for a few more miles on that. And then those two tire tracks became even more narrow. And it was just one lane now, tire tracks, bumpy, and gravel. Gravel. Then no gravel at all, but bumps. yes, bumps, bumpy. big bumps. Mario oh, stopped his that car. Was a bad one. Soon he, he plotted back to our vehicle with an untypical, really grim look on his face. Very seriously, he leaned in our window and Mario said in his best English, The road is gone. Uh-huh. Uh, bumpy. Uh-huh. Then he paused for a second and thought and he said, Bumpy as my butt. Uh, did he just say bumpy as my butt? Yeah, I guess. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was out of the car. I got out to see, you know, where we were at or just to get an idea of what was happening. I realized we had actually been motoring down nothing more than a footpath. What? <laughs> Oh, through the hot, dense grass in with no road in sight, really. And as Mario returned to his lead vehicle, he motioned with his hand to come along and follow him. Well, like we were going to drive off in a different direction. Uh, so, you kidding me? We're in the middle of nowhere. I'm following him. And we began forward movement once again. Man, this is bumpy. Yeah, I'll see. I watched as Mario's car in front of us with his family of four inside drove up this slight incline, and then his car just dropped 45 degrees. It disappeared down some slope. Down went the car. Then we slowly approached and saw that Mario was down at the bottom. Then our car down to the bottom. We were forging our little vehicle through a shallow creek. Hey, never mind the four-wheel drive vehicles that exist in the world. We're in like a old Honda Civic and some sort of a old beat up Toyota and they both were doing just great. Both vehicles shifted into first gear and the engine strained. And we began to 
go up the other side of the embankment, 15 foot embankment, I'd say. As we went up, uh, palm fronds from trees and scratchy bushes scratched the sides of our cars. Finally, we had made it through the heavy brush and we had made it through the trees. We had just come out of the jungle, it turned out. It was late in the afternoon as our small cars cleared the top of the incline. And there it was. The beach. A lone beach. A beach no one <laughs> could ever find. I mean, no one could ever find this beach <laughs> remote. The jungle was behind us and in front of us, 50 yards, 60 yards of beach and then the ocean, the Pacific Ocean. Out of the window, Mario yelled, This is it! This is it! <laughs> this is our home right here, Paul, right? For the rest of week. I found this. I am Big Cheese. Let's just call him the cheese, okay? And there it was, the beach. I smiled too because, well, I'd seen beaches before, but this, this, this was different. It was hot, as I said a thousand times here today. It was hot and very humid, yet there was this gentle breeze that wasn't in the jungle, but it was on the beach. It was a reminder, a gentle reminder, that breeze, that Mother Nature was gifting us a little bit of relief. We were based in a southwestern facing cove of the Pacific Ocean. Here's what I knew. Just sitting there in our cars still before we turn them off and park them and, and there's no people around at all. I knew that no tourists ever, ever could find this place. No tourists had ever even probably been there. Estimating there was like four miles of a curved cove. We drove our cars through the soft, soft sand. The sand which was without bugs, flying insects or other types of nuisances prevalent in so many other beaches. Those things, they stayed back in the jungle and were perfectly happy in there. So the beach, eh, not a great place for them. Nice. We saw no one. It was just us. There was not a single person there within sight. Mario, Reed, and I stopped, and we unloaded. We had to build a fire, so we, we scrounged for uh, driftwood on the beach. Uh, we had a respectable fire blazing, I remember. It was pretty good. It was a great beach fire. We tented up the, the driftwood. Nice. Good, huh? Then Mario almost predictably sang that Doors song. Hey, come on, baby. Light my fire. <laughs> Light my fire. Come on. Come on, baby, light my fire. Hi. <laughs> he sang it about ten times in a row, just that line. <laughs> Until Reed and I decided we needed to laugh out loud to get him to stop. <laughs> <laughs> From our beach home base, we looked way down the beach. We saw no one. We squinted. We could make out only, I think, four buildings. But they weren't buildings. They were just barely you know, places humans might be. Uh, three, it turned out to be bars, probably one bar per mile. And all were just open air pavilions. It was like a post in cement with a thatched roof. Uh, that was the bar. They weren't buildings per se. And there were also stood one kind of very large plain house. There were no cars there. There were no bicycles there, no sidewalks, anything like that just the beach and these four buildings. We could hear muffled voices pretty soon, and we knew there were people nearby, but we'd know where the voices were coming from. Well, they were the villagers of this town, and they were hiding in the brush. They had moved back into the jungle, because if you think about it, uh, nobody shows up to their beach hardly ever. Suddenly two cars come onto the beach, everybody went foot hid in the jungle. So all these villagers, I mean, I could call them natives, I could call them townspeople, but I think I'll just call them villagers. These villagers were very interested in us. They weren't afraid, they weren't aggressive, but they were timid, they were shy. 
simple people living a basic, daily, repetitive, yet very necessary existence. I realized that we would be living our week in the midst of nowhere. And that looked really exciting to me. It really did. I, I liked it. It turned out to be a place where I would find peace and quiet. And I would learn how to sit and just listen. It was a Zen kind of calm. The visitor. It's near sunset. The temperatures and humidity, oh, it didn't go away. Don't know why, but it didn't. It stayed at that heat, even as the sun was going down. It kept all of us uber sweaty and hot. Since we had arrived around 5 p.m. that first night, as I said, we built that fire on the beach, and Anna and the patties then, they cooked us this great meal. I'm not a cook. Reed's not a cook. They cooked for us. I recall black beans. I recall papaya that we had brought, and pork which was pre-cooked, so we warmed that up. And as we ate, from out of the jungle, there was some rustling, and a small boy appeared, stepped out of the jungle. He was dressed in what I would call functional pants, which just means these were pants he wore probably every day or every other day. And he had an old, drab, blue, oversized, button-down shirt, probably one that had belonged to someone else. He walked down to say, hola. Hola. He asked us if we were from Los Estados Unidos, the United States. Reed and I nodded and we smiled and we, we shook his hand. Si, sí, mi amigo, Reed said. A big grin filled the young boy's face and he turned around and he took off running. But now he's running down the beach, back toward the uh, pavilion. So Reed and I got a kick out of that. <laughs> How about that? That's kind of cool, huh, Reed? Kind of weird, though. Mario's family and the Patties thought it was funny. <laughs> Celebrities. The young boy had thought Reed and I were some kind of special of where we came from. We were tired from the car ride still. It had been a long day, but then something happened. Something that woke both of us up, woke us all up, and it cleared our heads. Very slowly, one by one, the villagers had made their way through the jungle to where we were camped on the beach. And there was about 30 or so people that lived there, and they introduced themselves to us. Mario said, They're coming to see us. <laughs> Mario bellowed, Hola, hello, hola, over here, hey. We were the strangers who arrived in cars on their beach. However, that was when I noticed something that I hadn't expected. Out of the eight of us, the villagers bypassed everyone else. They only wanted to talk to or try to communicate with me or with my roommate, Reed. It seemed that the villagers wanted to put their best foot forward for the guests on their beach. But the American guests... So we were then entertained by village children who sang beautifully for us. Some played guitars, old beat up guitars. They wove palm fronds for us and made little baskets, I remember, I still have mine. Some danced. While the sun sank into the western sky and the waves crashed into the shore nearby, the villagers just stared at us if they didn't entertain us. They looked at us. And I recall just smiling at the villagers and honestly being entertained by these people. It was nice. Reed and I clapped loudly. Reed was able to whistle. He whistled. The United States of America is unique to other people in other countries. And it appears kind of like a fantasy, like a utopia to other people sometimes. And it took me a while, but I realized that Reed and I were being treated like sports stars or movie stars or someone with who's earned that huh just being an american just made me an american mario's request pull tell 
villagers, I am the real Captain Crunch. While we're here, call me Captain. I thought you wanted to be called the Big Cheese. Yeah, the Cheese. So, Reed and I did just that. Usually we just yelled, Where's Crunch? Crunch! Crunchy! Hey, Mario! Crunchy! Call me Captain. Mario loved the notoriety. <laughs> the villagers... Special treatment for us, for Reed and me. It was odd. Very, it was uncomfortable and strange. Night Pavilion Bar. Soon we were all relocating down the beach to the closest pavilion bar, where we began to enjoy a few cervezas and beers, as did the locals. Now the entire village all 30 people, they were all there. Kids, senior citizens, probably some grandparents, uh, their parents, teens. The children drank soda or they drank water. Adults drank beer or water. That's what they had for adults. We were all sweating fiercely. So it's not something that's just common to people that don't live there. Tropical jungle sweat, I called it. I noticed that no one paid for their beverages. Someone somewhere was funding this roadless beach town. Night one. Uber hot and humid. As much as our group wanted to sleep, we just couldn't. We all stayed in the open air pavilion bar. All of us, kids, older people, middle-aged people. In broken English, the villagers told us things like, just wait. Stay here. Sleep come later. Okay. We agreed. I thought they just meant, you know, let's party or we're having fun now. We'll sleep later. But no, it turns out that wasn't it. Now everyone, and I do mean everyone, fell asleep at 2 a.m. every night. It was almost like watching people just drop asleep where they were sitting. What caused this? The heat and the humidity had been solid and uncomfortable all day, post-sunset, all night, until when the trade winds shifted, they changed directions as they did every night, right about 2 a.m. And at that time, the humidity kind of blew away. It lessened and a humid 90 degree night changed to a more comfortable and livable 75 degrees. From the children who were still awake to the adults, everyone seemed to slowly sit down in the sand or they put their heads down on the picnic-like ta picnic table-like tables. After a few cervezas, down went Captain Crunch too. Captain is sleepy like a... Down he went, Mario was asleep. <laughs> Now at sunrise, everyone groggily stood up. It was morning and they stood in line at the outdoor three saltwater showers. You know, if you're gonna live on a beach, you might as well take a saltwater shower. There was no fresh water anyway, except what we had brought in our water bottles. So they were used to saltwater showers. With the, they said they were filtered, but I, I pictured, I just pictured my mind, uh, saltwater going through a screen, <laughs> like a scre house screen and they called that a filter. Now, most people, most villagers showered with their clothes on because ocean water can wake you up in a hurry. That's a good thing. When you dry off, if you shower in your clothes, your clothes are act as if they have been starched, very stiff. I stripped down to my swimsuit to shower. That swimsuit was like wearing a starched, itchy, stiff collar all day from the cleaners. During the daylight hours, it was hard to tell exactly how many villagers lived there, but I, like I said before, I think it was around 30 or so, and no one went to work. There was no job to go to. However, everyone was busy. They were industrious. It was an industrious group of people. They were quiet. They were kind and constantly busy. They were building, repairing, hammering, washing, cleaning. So they were sweeping the dirt, sweeping the sand. There were many routines everyone went through every day. Each day, all work and all aggressive movement just stopped at 10 a.m. till 2 
p.m. daily. It was just too hot. Now, one routine that I found very fascinating occurred every day. Every day I witnessed a line of women from the village and they would walk onto a narrow path into the jungle. There were a few children with them, some young and middle-aged girls as well, perhaps a total of 10 people entirely. I noticed that these same women returned about 4 p.m. every afternoon to great fanfare. When the women returned, they all carried something. They balanced something on their heads, baskets, boxes. They carried massive ice blocks. They carried cases of cervezas, beer, other beverages, and fresh fruits. And sometimes they even carried a butchered pig. Apparently, there was a distribution center many miles inland, and this walk was a daily ritual for these hardy women. There wasn't any money used in this town. Most of the work was done for trade. And as I said before, we were living in the midst of nowhere, and I kind of liked it. Accessing the ocean. The villagers encouraged Reed and I also not to enter the Pacific Ocean. Reasons? Riptides, sharks at times, and possible potent quick sunburns were always prevalent. Besides, the village men used the ocean for a better purpose, to fish for the entire village. But the ocean teased us, you know? We saw it every day and there it was. It was like, uh... It was like a TV that was turned on. It was gorgeous. So on one occasion, Reed and I did enter the Pacific Ocean. We got onto the waves and we body surfed. What's body surfing? Basically, um, and a very untechnical definition is you go out far enough to where the waves begin, if they're high enough, and we had some good waves there. And then you kind of launch yourself. You swim a bit and you launch yourself and you catch a wave like a surfer might do, but instead your your body is in the middle of that wave and you're facing the shore and if you catch it right, you can ride that wave right in the middle. It carries you all the way to the shore. It's pretty fun. I do remember catching a, quite a few waves that day that actually carried me places. I, okay, honestly, maybe three out of 30. I don't know. It's a lot to me. And if you catch a good wave and it takes you all the way and it just carries you, and crashes you nose first into the beach, incidentally, when you, you, you hit the shore, it's worth it. Beach run. Now, back in the mid-Midwest, I knew that, you know, I wasn't really a strong runner, but I did go out and jog um, almost every day. And, and, and I couldn't run very far. I was not like a long-distance runner. It just wasn't the type of person that was me, but, but I knew it was good for me, so I did it. I could run for maybe, I don't know, one mile, two miles. If it's really cold, I had a hard time running. And then I'd stop. As we left the house and walked down to the beach, begin our jog, our run, we wanted to kind of run in and out of the water. You know, boys, having fun. We smelt the ocean-washed fresh air. Now, if you've been away from polluted areas, the ocean brings this really interesting, clean smell the brilliant blue sky and I mean it was this deep powerful rich blue sky seemed to illuminate all the flowering trees nearby giving off this scent it smelled like lilacs is what I'm trying to say it was this great aroma but I'm the waves rhythmic pounded on the shore so Reed and I ran southwest up the beach so here we were in a town with no name taking a jog at sea level, we ran in and out of the water, goofing around, and it was Reed that first began to laugh. And and I, I, I knew what he was gonna say. Paul, you even tired? No, me either. <laughs> What's going on? And we had run for maybe 10 minutes and we weren't even tired. We just were, kept moving and we were running faster. Well, elevation. In the mid-midwest, we were almost 700 feet above sea level. In the town with no name, we were at sea level. We could run for a long time. Hair clumps. 
Paul, call me Hair Clumps. No, Mario never said that. But Hair Clumps, after a few days with no fresh water, and we took those showers every morning with salt water, Reed's hair and my hair began to knot up in these hard, they were like dreadlock looking things. It was hilarious. And they just were in these hard, solid clumps of circles. Couldn't get a comb through it. Just happened. Mayor James. Let's jump back to that first night. The mayor came to meet us with a large group of people who were performing and dancing and playing guitars, etc. And he knew he had two Americans on his beach. That word got around quickly, I guess, to him. And their three-story house, which sat about 50 yards off the beach, down about a mile, was his. It was made of two-by-fours, plywood, and a lot of pressed board. <laughs> he was proclaimed mayor James. It did not take long to realize that Mayor James was about 30 years old. He was not a native of Costa Rica and he had found this remote village probably three years prior to that. He was the son of a wealthy philanthropist from France. Life had not given James a lot to do so he took his boat, his yacht, and he took it to Costa Rica and he built a shaky house that actually leaned when the wind blew. <laughs> you could see it, just a little bit. And he christened himself the mayor of the village. Eh, the people that lived around there didn't mind. Matter of fact, more people came in to live to on the beach than out of the jungle. The village that had no name. Mayor James actually called it that. He spoke three languages, French, Spanish, and he spoke English quite well. He was unsure of us at first. We were the gringos who had driven down his beach. Mayor James was kind of, I'd say, probably aloof to us that first night. And after I talked to him, he immediately realized that we were just college seniors working an internship in Costa Rica. And he relaxed a bit. We weren't a threat. I mean, there was absolutely no chance <laughs> of us pulling out a big wad of money and building house number two on his village's beach. And the villagers loved Mayor James. Why? He took care of them. He took care of their food, their beverages, their medical needs. He provided all other provisions that may not, they might need in their basically very simple life. He even loaned out one of his 70 or so gas-powered generators kept in a hut in the jungle to people who desired power for special occasions, if you wanted light in your house, you borrowed a generator. If you wanted a, uh, well, there was one blender. If you wanted that blender to run, generator. Music for playback on a boombox, generator. Conversation with the mayor. I asked Mayor James just one question that first night. So what do you call your town here? What's its name? Being from France, he had an English type accent. Uh, it's called a town with no name, my American friend. Although he was onto something in this small village, this type of government could only work in a very disconnected, distant place. Like a beach community with 30 people. The 30 people who shared the same ideas and same goals as he did. Basically, it was his ideas, and they went with it. It made their lives better. If a country was run like this, there would be chaos almost immediately. Too many people, personalities and things would get in the way. It would be a problem. Mayor James Generators. Now each night, Mayor James Generators and batteries came roaring to life. Like an audible go-kart track with maybe 30 to 40 generators running every night. The generators powered by the tiny, the three tiny beach pavilion bars kept drinks well refrigerated and a few light bulbs. It was lit and, 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 and the music came out of the boom boxes. Not a lot of music, but you know, enough to be run by a generator. I believe he owned, as I said, 70 or so gas generators. And when, <laughs> when they all were running, it was like, I felt like somebody was mowing grass in the park, but they were mowing with 70 mowers. So, the deal was a rich guy's son 
had found and maintained his own kingdom, a basic one. And I will always remember him saying to Reed and me, You are my special guests, my American friends. You will sleep in my house. Who were we to say no? Hot and humid still, always. A night two, we were shown Mayor James' house. It was a lot like that bar in Nicoya. It was dusty inside his house. It was dark wood because nobody ever painted. And when the wood got older, it was probably light wood. And, and because of the ocean and everything else around there, everything was this dark woody look, no paint. It was a lot cleaner than the Nicoya bar. It was three stories high and they, it was a flimsy thing, man. Like I said, when the trade winds shifted at 2 a.m., the house changed and leaned in a different direction. <laughs> that was when I better understood why we have building codes in the USA, <laughs> or any kind of codes for that matter. Reed and I would sleep in one of his many bedrooms in his house. Now his house had no decorations really. It was a guy's place, like a bachelor's place. It was too big for him. He shared and he offered generator cooled refrigerator items to us fresh pomegranates, uh, bananas, plenty of black beans, which were prevalent everywhere all over the country, and pre-cooked uh, pork and different kinds of meat to reheat on the outdoor fire. The house boasted Costa Rican pine, all dark wood, no paint, little furniture, and it reminded me a lot of my, back in the mid Midwest, some of my college friends who slept on the floor just to get through college without spending money. This town, with no name, had a routine. The remaining five nights we spent at the Pavilion Bar, where the villagers, their kids, and our group drank and we sang and we danced. We just sat there and tried to talk and communicate. And after every one of those hot and dark nights, the trade wind shifted at 2 a.m. But it was on the second night, night number two, that Reed and I both realized something and it wasn't like rocket science here but we realized no matter how much we drank or what we drank whether it be alcohol or pop or water we just sweat it out so after that it was not about what we were drinking but rather just drinking to stay hydrated okay whether it be beer pop or water at 2 a.m as the people began to fall asleep Reed and I sleepily zombie like <laughs> crunched down the beach to Mayor James' house. It was just an overall tiredness that I still can't really explain, but I recall entering Mayor James' house at that night, and I remember climbing the two stories up the press board steps. Now, press board is, you know, if you put all your weight on press board, it may break, so you're taking careful steps going up the steps not jumping hard or anything but you're just carefully stepping on each one we went to the third floor as we were told we entered a room that was about 12 foot by 10 foot and it was had this huge open air window opening there were no actual screens or glass windows in this house it was just openings for window in our barren room there were two hammocks that had been strung just a few feet apart and I wondered can I actually fall asleep? Could I sleep well in a hammock? Well, I did there. <laughs> all night, all week, exhausted from each day's heat, we fell into this immediate, deep, lasting sleep. It was also during that week that Mario and Anna announced to us that they would be having their second honeymoon that week. I didn't really know what that was, but I imagine there was some, you know, that they were going to have this romantic time. And we pleaded with Mario not to retell his romantic evenings and conquests to us. He started doing that. and It was like that immature guy in high school or junior high school, middle school, that brags and tells jokes about all the things he did and the girls he was with. That was Mario, and I think he was 47 at the time. Oh, too much big cheese. <laughs> Back at the mayor's house. Every morning, two things woke Reed and I up earlier than we wanted. Probably around 5 a.m. because the sun had cleared the trees by that time. 
and both were uh, yeah, both were kind of gross. Uh, number one, less gross. It was the heat in the house became unbearable, and on the third floor, oh, even with the uh, the trade winds coming through the open windows, it was hot by 5 a.m. each day. And this part is a little grosser. We woke up every morning to our hammocks filling up in our own sweat. <laughs> but being a guy and being 21 years old, the uniqueness of all that was like being in some kind of tropical adventure movie for both of us. We really liked it and we embraced that entire week and the entire experience. It was different. And difference not always a bad thing. So what's our takeaway? What did we learn? Well, what did I learn? Well, first off, the local beach town was full of this great sensory. It was like sensory overload. When you can stimulate a majority of your senses all at the same time, you will create a lasting memory. Try not to. <laughs> it's impossible. It was a week of feeling like I was constantly melting. However, the larger takeaway was much different than just the heat and humidity. I learned from this experience how respected and almost adored other people from smaller countries perceived the United States of America. These villagers thought that we were special for the simple reason that we lived in the United States of America. You know what? Sometimes you have to leave your mother country to actually realize how just plain good you have it in your own country. After living just a short time there in that little town with no name, I thought that the villagers there, they were special. Their lives were inspiring and they were basic. And here we are, almost 40 years later. And a town with no name has found a permanent place in my heart and in my soul. And every time I see a sunset in a place like Key West or the Cayman Islands or the Turks and Caicos, its beauty cannot compare to that little town on that faraway beach. A town with no name. For Life's Learning Curve, I'm Paul Hart. Subscribe to Life's Learning Curve at lifeslearningcurve.org and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Podchaser. Season 4, Episode 65, A Town With No Name of Life's Learning Curve Podcast was put together by producer Sebastian T. Dog, executive producer Paul Hart, technical director Connor Page, editor Paul Richards, audio and sound Riley Hart, production manager Heidi Cerner, studio equipment manager Don Compton. Thanks to our good friends Mario and Anna for all the adventure in Costa Rica back in the day. Find us on Facebook and listen to us just about everywhere podcasts are heard and visit our website, lifeslearningcurve.org and subscribe. Read a blog or shoot us an email. We're always happy to hear from you. This episode has imaginative voice recreations. To protect the privacy of others, some names have been changed and the characters conflated. Episode 65, A Town With No Name. I'm Paul Hart and we will be back soon with more from... Life's learning curve. We're clear. <laughs>